Hello everyone, I am the Bennett Kirby. Welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews and other deck techs. On this episode of The Brewery, I'll be discussing my take on a commander finally reprinted in Commander Masters, Swen Shuan, Lord of Wu. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description, it'll really help out the channel. But the very best way you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. There are plenty of perks for being a patron such as early access to certain videos, exclusive deck techs, gifts, and more. You can also support my channel for free by simply liking, subscribing, and sharing which also helps out a lot. I put out a video every Monday so you don't want to miss out. You can join my Discord server for free if you want to join the Commander Tavern community. I'll put it in and links are down in the description. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Swen Shuan is a 4-4 human soldier for 4 generic and 2 blue. He gives creatures we control horsemanship. And that's pretty much it. I've always loved this card even when it was only printed in Portal 3 Kingdoms. It then got a shiny, black bordered reprint in From the Vault Legends and was still affordable at a little under $10. That is until it made waves in a post Malone episode of Game Nights. Fortunately, it got a reprint recently in Commander Masters bringing its price back down closer to slightly over $10 rather than the $70 it was before. In any case, let's see the power of giving all of our creatures horsemanship. This commander costs a whopping 6 mana to cast the first time and in blue no less. This means that if we want Swen Shuan to stick around, we have to not only get that 6 mana to cast him the first time, but also still have enough mana to either protect him with responses or to equip protective equipment on him. This means that the deck has some setting up to do before even casting him, which is perfectly fine. In this case, we can start dropping our saboteurs in the meantime. Mischievous Cat Geist, Ninja of the Deep Hours, Sea Dasher Octopus, Silent Submersible, Acquisition Octopus, Nurok Commando, Ninetale White Fox, Soul Knife Spy, Tandem Lookout, and Thieving Otter are here just for drawing cards off of hitting our opponents, which makes them the best kind of saboteurs in the deck because they can help keep us a fat hand full of gas and interaction. A quick square fall search will return plenty more creatures that can trip when connecting with opponents, but I chose these because the first four have the potential of only costing two to cast. For example, the ninja can be ninjutsu for 2 mana, and the octopus can be flash mutated for 2 mana as well. That is also another reason why most of these creatures aren't human. If they were human, it's because of other useful abilities they might have. Also, the ones in this list of 3 CMC choices have a higher power than some of the other options. The cast spirit, both octopi and lookout have the potential of giving this ability to another creature. Well, the ghost cat has to be disturbed in order to do so, but it makes the card useful even after death but the Lookout grabs it via Soul Bond and the Octopus via Equipping. Sword of Fire and Ice is another equipment that turns the equipped creature into a cantripping saboteur. Not only that, but it also deals 2 damage to any target, which is great at pinging utility creatures and mana dorks. Just keep in mind that it gives protection from red and blue, so you won't be able to target equipped creature with most of our own effects. Going back to the cantrip saboteurs, the deck is also running Sturmgeist. It does cost a whopping 5 mana to cast, but it has flying and it's as big as your hand which for a blue deck won't be that difficult to achieve, especially with all the card draw effects in the deck. In any case, this also serves as a potential win con if someone can't block it, whether because they don't have flyers or creatures with reach, or because we have Sven Schwan in play and they don't have creatures with horsemanship. Same with Psychosis Crawler. While this asterisk asterisk creature doesn't cantrip when it connects, its power and toughness being equal to our hand will give quite the wallop when not blocked. However, it doesn't even need to swing to bring the pain. Whenever we draw a card, each opponent loses one life. Since we're potentially drawing a ton of cards each turn, that life loss will either add up quickly or win us the game right then and there. And speaking of drawing a ton of cards, especially on combat damage, Biden of Thassa, Coastal Piracy, and Reconnaissance Mission give this ability to all of our creatures, which is pretty epic in a deck like this. Since these are cheaper to cast than Swen Shuan, you can play these on curve before he comes out and then swing with everything to fill your hand back up. These cards are amazing here. Lilacory Tower, Thought Vessel, and the Cantler of Endless Water are naturally included due to how many cards the deck is capable of drawing us. The land doesn't take up a slot on the deck and the mana rocks are needed anyways because it's a non-green deck with Soul Ring being the only other mana rock. But we'll see the rest of the mana acceleration pieces later on. Seagate Restoration is another card draw effect in the deck that also has the added bonus of giving us a limitless hand size for the rest of the game, sort of like a pseudo emblem. It does cost a whopping 7 mana to cast and is win more if we already have a bunch of cards in hand, but this matters for some of the deck's win cons, and you can always play it as an untapped land if you're in a pinch. Plus, it doesn't take up a spell slot if you're not greedy and play it as a land if you missed your land drop. 
Continuing on with the saboteur effects in the deck, I tried to keep it to things that drew me cards but also interacted with opponents. It is a blue deck after all. We're almost required to make the table as miserable as possible. That's what it means to play an island on turn 1 after all. Blade Griff prototype and Sword of Sinu and Steel provide such interaction. The prototype already has a form of evasion already on it, but it is clearly better once Swen Xuan hits the board. It's also a political tool when we're not the arch enemy since we could strike deals in order to handle worse threats on the board. This card is just good overall. The sword can destroy a planeswalker and or artifact while giving protection from relevant colors, so it could also be used as a protective equipment too. Sludge Monster is a card I love and I'm surprised to not see more of. It turns a non-horror creature into an ability-less 2-2 when it enters the battlefield and when it attacks. If it had horsemanship then you can swing in with total abandon and start nerfing your opponent's creatures. Somebody has an Abyssin? Lol at them by turning her into a 2-2 ability-less creature. Best of all, it triggers on attack. So if your opponents had a board state you can swing into without the monster dying, you can do it regardless if it was unblockable or not. Cephalid Constable and Misplaced Shinobi bounce things when they connect. The Constable is a 1-1 by default so it only bounces one thing, but if pumped by equipment or the boon effects in the deck, it can bounce more things. Notice that it's not limited to non-land permanents, so if it was big enough, you could potentially lock out the biggest threat off the board by bouncing multiple lands of theirs. The Shinobi can only return creatures to hand but it's still great at dealing with big tokens or annoying creatures when it connects. Best of all, its ninjutsu cost is just one blue. Tradewind Wider can also bounce any permanent, even lands, independently of combat. All you have to do is tap it and two creatures you control. This can also bounce lands which is great at dealing with Maze of Ith effects. I love this card and it does a lot of work here. Then again, overloading Cyclonic Rift is the best way to deal with aggravating boards. However, this could also be used proactively because if there are no creatures on board, then it won't matter if our server tours are unblockable or not. Rootwater Thief provides some more interaction but this time by getting rid of things in an opponent's library. So we're not even giving them the opportunity to cast it or even have it in play or their hand. We're just yeeting it into oblivion. This is amazing against combo decks and any other deck you feel will have responses to our board. You could potentially get rid of the best card in their deck but try and get rid of the worst card against our deck. We do have to pay 2 when it triggers but that's fine. Too generic to get rid of Supreme Verdict or any other problematic card? Great. Also you could pay 1 blue to make it fly until end of turn. This card is just amazing all around. All on a 2 CMC 1-2. Speaking of disrupting libraries, we also have Dazzling Sphinx, Sphinx Ambassador and Thada Adele Acquisitor. Dazzling Sphinx already has a form of evasion on a decent body for 5 CMC. So if cast before Sen Xuan, it'll definitely connect the turn you cast him if you're on curve. In any case, free casting the next instant or sorcery off an opponent's library is amazing. Unless you hit a counter spell, anything will be good. You'll either hit ramp, removal, or some blowout bomb. Unless you're playing against jank decks like Zada, Fetter, etc. Swinging for those last. Sphinx Ambassador will almost always get you the creature for free. A lot of times opponents seize up and forget the best creature in their deck, or at least what they consider their best creature to be, since we might consider that to be something else. It does cost a whopping 7 mana to cast but it's a 5-5 flyer that will get you an opponent's best creatures for free. When connecting with Thada Adele, make sure to always keep at least 1 mana open so that you can cast the defending player's soul ring from their library. Once you've collected all soul rings then you can steal other things. It's a shame that Spy Eye is silver bordered. This is definitely a thievery saboteur like the other three because it draws cards off of defending player's library. At least this is fun in my commander cube. Going back to stealing artifacts, who comes to pirates is able to steal any artifact if it's unblocked. Fortunately for us, horsemanship creatures are few and far between so this will almost always snag us an opponent's best artifact. Deluxe Dragster is another thievery effect but for instants and sorceries already in an opponent's graveyard. Being able to cast them for free is amazing, especially since we're doing so during the combat damage step of the combat phase, so we're sort of cheating timing restrictions on sorceries. Best of all, it has built an evasion because it can only be blocked by vehicles. However, even with all these cards shown, the best interaction will always be player removal. Ink Moth Nexus and Mirex are slow but steady since they give opponents poison counters. Ink Moth Nexus might seem slow since it's a 1-1, but it doesn't take up a slot in the deck. And since it's infect and not toxic, if it's pumped then it'll give more poison counters. Mirex doesn't animate but it does pop out 1-1 tokens with toxic 1. Accumulate enough of these and it's game over. It also taps for blue the same turn it enters the battlefield so don't gloss over that. Contested Warzone, another land of the deck, is a free way of pumping your creatures. Well, free in the sense that it doesn't take up a slot since you still have to pay 1 and tap it. But at the very least, it gives all attacking creatures plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. 
Even if an opponent steals it by hitting us, we can just get it back the same way. No, while these effects are admittedly slow, quite a spike and scythe claw get it done faster. With the equipped creature taking away half the opponent's life after connecting, it will make the game much faster. So keep in mind that the opponent first loses life from the damage dealt by the equipped creature, and then their life total is halved. Strixhaven Stadium does it even faster though. This 3 CMC mana rock is a point counter whenever you tap for mana, and whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to an opponent. So if you're swinging in with a bunch of saboteurs each combat step, you'll definitely get to 10. And what do we want 10? Once it has 10 counters or more, we remove them all and that player loses the game. This can be achieved realistically each turn if we had 10 unblockable creatures in play. Some of the tour effects aren't just on card advantage nor interaction pieces either. These are just two out of the three major aspects of every commander deck, the other being mana acceleration. Thus, the deck is running Bitter Thornness's Animus, Sword of the Animus, and Sword of Hearth and Home. The first two are okay even without unblockability since they trigger on attack and not combat damage. However, if the equipped creature is unblockable, then you can attack with total abandon without worrying about it dying in combat for the sake of ramping for a basic island. The third one does require connecting but that's fine since it gives a decent boon along with protection from relevant colors. It also blinks the creature as a bonus which will only really matter for something like Sludge Monster. Sword of Feast and Famine is another mana acceleration piece in the deck that depends on combat damage. Being able to untap all of our lands to have them available in our second main phase or to just keep them up for counter spells is incredibly strong. As a bonus, it also forces the defending player to discard a card for even further disruption. There's a reason this is considered the best one of the Mega Cycle. Cosima God of the Voyage also provides combat damage dependent land based mana acceleration, but only if you played the card as the Omen Keel. As this vehicle, whether it or another vehicle, deals combat damage to an opponent, they exile that many cards from the top of their library, and then you can play lands from amongst those cards as long as they remain exiled. With enough lands exiled, you will essentially never miss your land drops. Take that, green decks. Dowsing Dagger is another land ramp effect in the deck that, like Kosama, only does so with its backside. In this case, when the equipped creature deals combat damage, the dagger transforms into Lost Veil. And that's pretty much it. But getting a land that taps for 3 mana isn't anything to scoff at, especially if the creature connects early on. The deck is still running extra mana lands though, like Ancient Tomb, Guildless Commons, Temple of the False God, Coral Atoll, and Soldavi Excavations, so that we get extra mana independently from combat or any other shenanigans. We do have a 6 CMC commander after all. But with all the ways to not miss land drops, even Temple of the False God is good here. That being said, Nyctos trying to Nyx obviously outclasses all of these lands. There's a lot of colorless permanents in the deck, but we'll always have a high enough devotion to blue where this will tap for a ton of blue mana when we activate it. Even then, the deck still has independent land-based ramp like Wayfarer's Bobble, so don't worry. 3 total mana for a basic island straight to the battlefield isn't that bad. The deck's also running Terrain Generator to help with dropping extra lands. This is better used at the beginning of the end step before ours though, since it's always best to keep our mana up for our responses. The deck is running 19 islands, so we're definitely going to have a couple in our hand if we're drawing a ton of cards. Plus, it always gives us things to fetch for with our land-based ramp effect swords. Lastly, Sapphire Medallion, Kefnitz Monument, and Defiler of Dreams help with mana acceleration by reducing the cost we'd pay anyways. The Medallion, now relatively affordable once more, reduces the cost of all of our blue spells, whereas the Monument only does so for blue creatures. That being said, whenever we cast a creature, we can freeze down a creature, which is another way of making our creatures harder to block. The Sphinx requires us to pay 2 life for one of the blue costs, which is great if we want to keep up islands for counter magic. Speaking of counter magic, that is just one of many ways to not only protect our commander, but our board state as well, or to prevent combo players from winning since they are the bane of mid-range decks like this one. The decks running Fierce Guardianship, an offer you can't refuse, Swan Song, Negate, Mana Drain, and Counterspell for its counter magic suite. Thanks to the first one, we don't need to keep extra mana up after casting Swen Shuan since it'll be free once he's in play. Speaking of protecting our commander, Champion's Helm, Commander's Plate, Dark Steel Plate, Giant's Amulet, Lightning Greaves, Mithril Coat, New Rock Stealth Suit, and Swiftfoot Boots are naturally included. Why am I running almost every protective equipment possible? Because the deck is highly dependent on the commander. While that's not always wise, it's more possible in mono blue than most other colors because we can run the protective equipment as well as interaction. And because the deck's also running Archetype of Imagination and Deep Channel Mentor as redundancy for our commander. Yes, they're in the 99 and not in the command zone, but once we're drawing a ton of cards, we should eventually have access to these for when keeping Swen Shuan around isn't that possible anymore. 
The Mentor is the best one though since our blue creatures are outright unblockable. Creatures with reach can still block our flyers from the archetype. Access Tunnel and Rogue's Passage can help with making our creatures unblockable, but only one at a time. However, since these are lands that can tap for mana without entering the battlefield to tap, they don't take up slots in the deck. Teferi's Veil is another way to protect our board against sorcery speed board wipes because any creature that attacked will phase out after combat. They're tapping to attack so it's not like we'll be able to use them to block anyways. So this enchantment is an amazing way to protect our attackers with literally zero effort. Interestingly, Bioluminary is another way to provide protective effects. Yes, it gives us tickets and then we could put stickers on our non-land permanents when it deals combat damage, but hear me out. Putting stickers on our commander is absolutely busted because our commander won't ever go to a hidden zone if we didn't want it to. So the stickers will stay on it. So what stickers am I talking about? Well, out of the 10 in our sticker board, Misunderstood Trapeze Elf, Night Bushrog Ringmaster, Phyrexian Midway Bamboozle, and Unsanctioned Ancient Juggler all provide some form of protection on a sticker. The first one has a Hexproof sticker for 3 tickets, the next one has a Persist sticker for 3 tickets, the next one has an Undying sticker for 3 tickets, so if these are 2 of the 3 sticker sheets you start the game with, putting both of them onto Swen Shuan essentially makes him unkillable, he'd have to be bounced, exiled, or tucked to be dealt with. And the last one has an indestructible sticker for 4 tickets. So these stickers are amazing here. The last two even have stickers that trigger on combat, either getting us another ticket or bolster one. The remaining stickers, Happy Dead Squirrel, Playable Delusionary Hydra, Sassy Gremlin Blood, Sticky Cabo Daredevil, Trendy Circus Pirate, and Zombie Cheese Magician, all have a sticker that triggers via combat. The first one has an Infect sticker for 3 tickets, giving us another Infect source. The next one has a sticker that gains us life and draws us a card. The one has a sticker that creates a treasure when it attacks. The next one has a sticker that pumps our creatures plus 1 plus 1 when it attacks, which is a decent boon effect. And the next one creates that many 1-1 one -one squirrels when it attacks, plus it also comes with a death touch sticker. And the last one has us draw as many cards as combat damage dealt. Another thing to keep in mind with not just these stickers but the other four is that they also have power toughness stickers, so you can also make your beaters even bigger. However, Bioluminary is the only card in the deck that not only gives us tickets but applies stickers as well. So if stickers aren't your kind of bag, you can just swap out Bioluminary for something like Grafted Exoskeleton. This helps end game faster by giving a boon on top of the infect, so this could easily take out an opponent when equipped to an unblockable creature. But I did want the deck to be a bit fun, so I have Bioluminary instead. It is pretty helpful too regardless of which 3 stickers you end up getting from that pile of 10. Speaking of fun, the final 3 cards in the deck, Glass Pool Mimic, Nascent Metamorph, and Schema Thief are included for the fun factor. Well, Glass Pool Mimic doesn't technically take up a spell slot in the deck if you're not greedy and play it as a land to not miss your land drop, so there's no real reason not to run it. But the other two also have copying effects. The Metamorph is pretty fun because it's possible to end up revealing a mana dork or other utility creature, but if a bomb is revealed, then it's going to be dealing a ton of damage, all on a 2 CMC creature and it's on attack so it'll happen before blocks, but you're preferably attacking with it if it's unblockable. Schema Thief creates a copy of an artifact from the offending player when it deals combat damage. It has built-in evasion which is great. At the very least, getting a soul ring each combat step is something to scoff at. This brews just an idea of how to build around Swen Shuan Lord of Wu. This is a deck that I always wanted to make for the channel but never got around to it. Then when the card skyrocketed in price, I put it on the back burner indefinitely. But thanks to Commander Master's reprint, it's now viable once more, and I figured one final deck tech for the set before Walls of Eldrain previews begin would be a good way to send it off. If you're interested in the decklist of the Spicy Brew of Mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me, and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link, that also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of the Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am the Medit Kirby, and happy brewing.